Hello and welcome. I'm Professor Sharon Ruston um, in the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing at Lancaster University. Um, and today I'm going to talk a bit about um, John Keats's La Belle d'un Saint-Marcy and also Samuel Taylor Coleridge's um, Ancient Mariner and his poem Christabel. I'm going to be thinking about all three texts as Gothic texts. Um, so, the Gothic aimed to invoke a so-called pleasing horror in its audience, and to do so tapped into the fears and concerns of the reading public with stories of ignorance, superstition, repression and tyranny. These were hugely topical, of course, even when set in a far off place or time. It's quite possible that Gothic authors were thinking of the political concerns of Britain at the time that they were writing. For those who don't know, the feudal form of political and economic government, which we had in Britain during the medieval period, involves the paying of tithes or taxes to a local landlord who owns the land where you live. The revival of Gothic styles was part of the romantic interest in the medieval and can be seen as part of the emerging national identity Britain was forging during this time um, while it was at war with France. One role that literature played as part of romantic culture was to encourage and challenge a sense of national identity and nationhood. Indeed, the concept of nation, as we now understand it, is one that emerged at this time. A nation has been described as an imagined community by Benedict Anderson in his book of that name. Because nations are often defined by imaginary rather than geographical borders. During this time, as I've said, Britain was almost continually at war with France. It was seriously afraid of an invasion, whether from France itself or from French allies in Ireland, and as a result was roused by a patriotic cry to defend its borders, both physical and ideological. In 1800, the Act of Union formed the United Kingdom, as we now know it, and thus the idea of Britain as a nation was formed. The Union Jack flag was first used in 1801 to symbolise this new nation and stereotyped characters representing the English and the French in political cartoons were instrumental in developing this sense of national identity. So I'd like you to pause uh, for a moment now and do a bit of research on um, the Union Jack flag and try to find out how um, it was composed because it's actually shows many flags within one flag. So you can see how all the different nations um, became part of the Union Jack. So do some research on the Union Jack flag um, and then come back to the lecture. As part of this drive for a unified national identity, there was an interest in the past of Britain, which subsequently also helped in the formation of the national identities of Scotland, Wales, England and Ireland. There was a search to find antiquities that could prove that Britain had been an ancient civilization. For example, James Macpherson translated and published collections of poems in the 1760s that he claimed had been written by a third century Gaelic poet, Ossian, though it later emerged that these were all forgeries. Attempting to find an English equivalent, Thomas Percy published a collection of ballads under the title relics of ancient English poetry in 1765, claiming that these were the work of ancient English bards. And he too came under criticism for altering the authentic manuscripts when he published them. Joseph Ritson, a radical vegetarian, also published his own collection of ballads in opposition to Percy's. He published Ancient Songs in 1790 and Robin Hood in 1795. All of the poems that you've read that I'm going to talk about are based in the feudal medieval world and two of them are ballads, The Ancient Mariner and La Belle d'en Saint-Marcy. A ballad, as you may well know already, um, is a poem that is made up of four line stanzas. Um, it's often seen as a low form of culture um, but it was also a peculiarly English poetic genre. Um, often the second and the fourth lines rhyme and 
you often have I mean I'm giving you a kind of general uh, pointers here for a ballad because there are there are some differences um, but usually it's three beats per line in, and then four beats per line alternating so the world of Christabel Coleridge's poem Christabel is a distinctly feudal and medieval one Sir Leoline is the Baron Rich whose castle Christabel takes Geraldine into. The poem is suffused with archaic language and spelling, so he uses I ween for I suppose, um, and country instead of the way we would spell country, and lots of other examples. Christabel promises her father's chivalrous protection, um, and when Geraldine meets Sir Leoline, he promises the same. While the medieval set in, setting might not be so immediately obvious in the ancient mariner, there is a hermit, um, for example. Coleridge again uses deliberate archaisms, such as f soons for always, and I wist instead of I knew. In La Belle, it is of course immediately clear that this is a medieval feudal world. He is a knight at arms. And Keats makes reference to this world again in another poem, Eva St Agnes. So on the one hand, feudal settings were commenting upon the very topical discussion of who should hold power and how it should be wielded. They drew attention to the class system and perhaps made comparison between unfair forms of government then and now. Such poems hearkened back to a dark world of tyranny and oppression at a time when some were arguing that tyranny and oppression was again present in the world. So in Coleridge's and Keats's time. Medieval settings also hearkened back to a world of religion, superstition and belief in the supernatural. And so use, use of such settings can be seen as a reaction against the enlightenment ideals of reason and progress. The new science of psychology was emerging at this time, particularly in Germany, a country that Coleridge had visited and in whose literature, um, including scientific literature, he was very well read. He was interested in this new science, as well as in other related sciences, such as mesmerism, which would become hypnosis, and which you can see in the ancient mariner in the way that the mariner holds the wedding guest's attention. So pause here for a moment and go back to that poem and have a look at those moments where the, um, the wedding guest interrupts the mariner and see what is said and how the mariner is described in those sections. Okay, so hopefully you could see there was a lot about the eyes and the way that he was holding him with the power of his eyes and, and, his, and his language. So there's a, a, there was a more general uh, interest in the psychological aspects of literary characters with some innovations in narrative form. Even in Gothic novels where supernatural or seemingly supernatural events occurred, there was a real attempt to faith, faithfully represent the mind's response to those unusual situations. So they're very interested in the psychology of the mind. The 1790s in particular, there are partic a similar situation exists in the 1810s too, when Keats is writing, was a time of great political unrest and insecurity. People considered to be unpatriotic or politically radical in other respects were in serious danger of being arrested, imprisoned or transported. During this time, the government was extremely repressive because they were worried about the possibility of revolution and employed agent provocateurs or government spies to infiltrate and report on anti-government activity. All of this is familiar to the reader of The Ancient Mariner, which features a distinctly unreliable narrator. At one point, the wedding guest is terrified that he is speaking to a ghost but instead we are told that he is the sole survivor of an ordeal that could not be survived. The fact of his survival sends the pilot boy who has come to rescue him mad. He describes a state like paranoia a few times in the poem, such as in the following lines which were quoted again in Frankenstein. So the mariners, um, like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on and turns no more his head because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. These lines are quoted to describe 
Victor Frankenstein's emotional and mental state in the immediate aftermath of his creation of the creature. They are wonderfully evocative. So Frankenstein quotes the ancient mariner. There's no need to turn around to look at the road behind you because you know that there is something there that will do you harm. It suggests a paranoid state because the certainty may well simply be paranoia. You could do something very clever with these lines, thinking about the way that the metrical feet, so the pattern of beats, reflects the certain and impending approach of the fiend. So the stress upon the last foot, dread, head, tread, enacts the movements of those heavy footstop, footsteps approaching. You could see the form of the poem too, the ancient mariner, as claustrophobic, confining and oppressive. With the repetition of rhyming sounds and the repetition of words and phrases rounding off the stanzas, the poem could be thought of as going round in circles and circles within circles. And the mariner's tale is of course going to be endlessly repeated itself. The night that Christabel finds Geraldine is cold but strangely still. There is no wind, just as there was no wind to move the ship in the ancient mariner. All of the narrators in these poems can be regarded as trauma victims, having survived intensely traumatic incidents. The night in La Belle Dame seems to be wasting away, following his encounter with this femme fatale. His mental state is no long to, long, longer to be relied upon either. So now I'd like you to pause the lecture and to go back to La Belle dans saint mercy and have a look at the line lengths and, and see um, how long the lines are and what the patterns are there. Okay, the final line of each stanza in La Belle dans saint mercy is a short footed line. It's trimeter rather than tetrameter, which means there are, th are three feet rather than four feet in every line. So three beats per line, rather than four beats per line. And it uses less syllables. So the fourth line is not in the iams of the earlier three lines. Instead, it uses spondees and other metrical patterns. So these are the, um, the rhythms that are in the line um, there. So on the whole, on, sorry. So on the cold hill's side, which is repeated twice in the poem, is comprised of an anapest and then a spondee. So it's unstressed, unstressed, stressed, 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 or dee dee dum, dum dum, on the cold hillside. What is Keats doing here? Why does he use this pattern for the fourth line, do you think? I think it perfectly encapsulates the psychological state of the night his stunted, almost disbelieving and helpless response to his abandonment. The ancient mariner's impulse to tell his tale over and over again and the repetition within the narrative can be seen as a symptom of trauma. In contrast, Christabel is not able to speak of what she's seen. So whereas one person endlessly talks, the other character can't talk at all. Her curse is to be silenced and thus to seem rude and inhospitable to her guest, thereby incurring her father's anger. The powerlessness to speak of a traumatic incident can be a, con a common symptom of trauma, as much as the inability to stop speaking about it. Famously, Anna Barbord, another poet of the time, objected that the ancient mariner lacked a moral, to which Coleridge replied, that he thought the poem had too much. Certainly the poem gives the mariners shooting of the albatross as the reason why these terrible subsequent events occur. The gloss to this line makes the reason all, more, all the more concrete. So you get a little note to this line. The ancient mariner inhospitably killeth the pious bird of good omen. Um, and we now use the phrase albatross around my neck to refer to some burden or weight that, the, that we carry. And this comes from this poem. We are told by this note that the mariner, the sole living creature on board the ship, despises what he call a thousand thousand slimy creatures in the sea. And he is incapable of prayer. 
It's only when he's able to see the beauty in these water snakes and blesses them instinctively that the albatross falls off. At the end of the poem, the moral is offered that we should love all of God's creatures, all things great and small. Perhaps, but perhaps this reference to God came a little late for Barbord, since the main agents of the poem have been distinctly unchristian, death and life in death, the possession of the crew's bodies by angelic spirits, and the spirit from the South Pole that avenges the killing of the albatross. While Christabel is the epitome of innocence and goodness, whatever she does see that night when she lies with Geraldine makes her feel that she has done something wrong. She says, sure, I have sinned. This begs the question of what did take place. Um, and this is also true for the, for the La Belle d'En Saint Mercy. What happened? We never know. Um, and that's all from me. Thank you very much.